Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Today's show is going to bring someone to you who is quite remarkable. And when I'm done, I want you to help me honor him as we bring him on. He's an Army combat veteran, both stage and film actor. He's a writer, producer, stuntman, an author, and even a boxer. While in the Army, he served a year with the 18th MP Battalion along with the 306th MP Unit, OIF-3. And he studied with Stella Adler in, well, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. But he also graduated from the NYU Tisch Drama Program. And this is something you're going to recognize him as soon as you see him, if you're not already taking a peek. Or if you're listening via podcast or radio and you get a chance to check it out on some of the visual platforms, you're going to you're gonna know exactly who we're talking about today. But with us, oh my goodness, he has over 35 uh, entertainment credits combined. So you'll want to check out his IMDb page. But he has co-starred with the late Victor Argo in the last film that he was in, Personal Sergeant, along with co-starring... Uh, opposite of Matt Damon in Green Zone. This is, I already know you know who this is, but oh, just wait for it. There's more. He's performed uh, with Edward Norton off Broadway in Waiting for Lefty, along with Peter Dinklage in Taming of the Shrew. Mm -hmm. And he boxed amateur in the New Jersey Diamond Gloves under the training hall of fame, training under the hall of fame coach, Ted Gonzalez. <laughs> Yes, this is so exciting. And he is a company member of Pacific Resident Theater in Venice, California. So welcome to the show as we honor, yes, Jerry Della Sala. Welcome. Hey, Rebecca. Great to see you. Great talking to you. <laughs> it's great to see and talk with you, too. You have done so much. You've started your life with just such a focus. One of the things that I really just want to honor and thank you for is the time you spent in service uh, um, for us. And I just have to ask you, did you start in entertainment prior to that or was this? Yes. Oh. Uh, yes. And, and, and my, uh, my acknowledgement to your service as well. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I actually did, you know, uh, my, my, my career path leading into the military was an interesting one because I had a full fledged, um, you could say theatrical career in New York, uh, having yes, been initially educated through NYU Tisch and Stella, and then kind of the way the system works, it spits you right out into the, uh, the, uh, the theater track of, yes. of New York. And, um, and, uh, I got fortunate upon graduation. I was uh, swept up by an agency right away. Um, and, uh, started a cycle out into a lot of good contract jobs in the, uh, in the theatrical realm under equity, um, for Shakespeare fests. And, uh, that's where I met Peter Dinklage off Broadway. Oh. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's where I work with Ed Norton. Um, so I, I really had a full kind of theatrical career. I was working commercials and soaps and as my career progressed and, um, at the turn of the new millennia, um, I had about 11 years behind me and, uh, it really was, uh, with some, you know, pockets of, yeah, of course, like everybody, unemployment struggle. Um, but I, I was blessed. Um, I had also been praise God. I had been converted early in my, uh, my path as an actor, um, to where I, I started to do a lot of work for the Lord in church, um, as well. Um, but by nine 11, like I said, I, I had a, about a decade under me and the attacks happened on, you know, at the towers, which was right in my backyard. Um, so there was a real cataclysmic switch, you know, because it had affected me so much personally. Mm -hmm. um, that my priorities really, really started to shift um, away from my my own interests and towards patriotism. And okay. um, 
And I think six months after 9-11, I had uh, found myself walking to a Harlem recruiting station on 125th Street. Um, and I walked in to that recruiting station and I was 32 at the time. Okay. So I was, I was not their target number of recruitment. Um, sure. And I walked in and to them, I must have been some old guy. Um, and uh, I looked around and there was like a Marine table and an Air Force table and an Army table. And I looked at each one of those recruits, uh, the recruiting uh, NCOs, and I said, who wants me? And I remember <laughs> <laughs> I remember the two, uh, the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine table kind of laughed. Um, and it was the only the only guy that kind of looked at me up and down seriously, you know, was this army guy in the back. And he went like this to me. And he said, oh, you know, I'll play this. And he sat yeah. me down. And because he was the only one. Um, I started my, you could say, um, research into what this real career shift would be, uh -huh. um, especially for a guy my age. But he was more supportive um, in in making like a pro and con list for me. And he started checking off all these things that were far more outweighing the cons. I think he only had two checklists on the cons. Everything else was a long laundry list of you got a lot of reasons to go in at okay. your age with your education. Um, and I said, look, I just I just want to make a difference. Um, I want to fight terrorism. I want to make a difference. Um, I want to help secure my country. And about a month or two after that initial visit to that office, I remember raising my hand. Yeah, and um, that was how it began. So, okay. so did you go in under a general enlistment or did you know you had taken a test and they told you this is what your MOS is going to be? You know, what it was, was I, uh, I, I went in the reserves and, um, you know, the initial entry pro process starts for everybody under the MEPS and, um, and I asked fab test and I tested high. Mm -hmm. um, so with a college degree on the university level and testing high, that same recruiter started to see, as you could most likely, you know, um, imagine, um, a lot of bells yes, and, uh, a lot of whistles going that, Oh, I got a live one here that I could, I could shift in this way or that way. Um, I learned early though, that the Bravo series for MOSs in the army are the fighting series. And, you okay. know, at the time I just, yeah, yeah. When we, okay. when we yeah. Uh, you know, when we categorize something in the army as, 11 Bravo, 31 Bravo. That's a fighting MOS. Okay. Um, 11 Bravos being infantry, 31 being the MPs. So I said, look, I just, you know, I want to be a part of something that, you know, is a Bravo. And he's like, why don't you go uh, MP? Um, because MPs are very big on the reserve side in New York. It's, it's a lot of history. Uh, Jimmy Cagney even did a movie about the fighting 68th, which is a very famous unit that fought in like every offensive from like the first world war. Oh, and, interesting. Yeah. But it's a guard unit, not a reserve unit. Um, okay. So he's like, look, we got the 800th MP right here in Uniondale, New York, which is Long Island. I said, I'm in sign me up. <laughs> So what was funny was I was in, I was from my, my contract. Initially I was signed up to be an MP. And from there I got my MOS and then I got a couple other MOSs, one in theater. And, uh, you know, I signed a, what they call a six and two, six years active, two years inactive, if you wish. Um, and the only reason I went inactive at that latter part of my, my contract was because I had a, I had, I had a, a major movie that I was shooting. Mm -hmm. so it, I needed to be available internationally. So, um, but uh, that's really where it started and how it went for me for those eight years. And uh, so. Well, um, I know just a little bit from some things that I've seen about you and heard you talking with 
others mm -hmm. on different programs. And I know that you had some time um, while you were in, in theater and have a story to go with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mean my play or my? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. Um, yes. Th thank you for bringing that up. I, uh, I, I just started the final uh, phase, if you will, of um, bringing uh, me and my writing partner, Brian Ulrich, to uh, a place where we're at that completed first draft of a screenplay of a play that I wrote. Uh, the play was called Camp Redemption. It has since been retitled for screen uh, to Miracle at Camp Redemption. Um, oh, I got chills. Yeah, wow. it's, wow. it's it is loosely based on my tour. Um, a lot of it though has some dramatic license to it. Um, mm -hmm. and there's a major infusion, if you will, of my faith-based principles and beliefs that I want to, uh, challenge the audience on, you know, as well as invite them in to, uh, create a dialogue. And, um, what's beautiful about meeting Brian is, um, you know, he's, he's a faith-based filmmaker, um, <clears throat> but he's very strong in, um, I think seeking the truth, not saying that other faith-based filmmakers aren't, but I think there's a pulse that he has on what it is in our, in our genre of filmmaking within the industry that's working and not working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can say what you want about what I call the, um, the crazy Mel um, misinterpretation. And by that, I mean, Mel Gibson, um, whatever you you know about his um his bio or his past i just i've always said look does he make a really good movie as a filmmaker mm -hmm. you know? and i think that's unavoidably yes particularly to me the one movie that started the blitzkrieg if you will of faith-based films which was the passion yes um, yes you know i mean my god that movie's ability to digest the time period the language, the actual act of crucifixion. You know, I remember when I came into the faith, for some reason, one of the first things I did was a, a study on Roman, uh, the art of Roman persecution, you know, under the state, you know, and crucifying was the great thing that they had um, uh, manufactured for penalty. But nobody knows if you look at any movie prior to Mel Gibson's passion, nobody knows really sadly the horror and the the magnitude of that. Mm -hmm. This is true. Yeah. When you watch that movie, I remember watching that movie um, and saying to myself, my God, because it's so long of, a, it is. you know, it and, is. and he is not pulling any punches to showing you how graphic it was, you know? Um, people were fainting in the theaters when I was there, you know, and this That's is no, interesting. Yeah, no, I remember twice I went, it was right before I was getting ready to get deployed. Um, and twice at both separate occasions, somebody passed out and, you know, because of the fact that I think what Mel wanted to do was say, you're, you're a Christian. You say you believe mm -hmm. and watch what your savior went through for you. Mm -hmm. Watch what he sustained for six hours. And then the three remaining were the cross itself. You know, it, to me, you can't hide that, you know, as a believer. And I, no. and I, you know, so going back, what I'm, what I'm encouraged about with my writing partner and about where we're at now is, you know, we've kind of, um, we committed to that mission with our script and um, it's good to see where it's at a place right now um, where, um, you know, we can, um, we can just, we can kind of enhance it, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, evolve it to um, hopefully a, a similar end, you know? Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. I think that there is so much, not only on the acting side that you've done, but the, from a writing perspective, because the creativity mm. that's within you just exudes. And then 
when you're able to bring it to life. So between what you and Brian have going, it's, mm-hmm. there's just going to be so much that is going to draw people in and they're going to be just as captivated. Cause I mean, you, I mean, you have really focused in on what you have envisioned mm-hmm. as well as made sure that the right person is going to be able to deliver that. And that is crucial. Yeah. yeah I prayed a lot about it. Um, and I had a lot of people that were coming to the, the interview process, uh, And I just, I prayed for wisdom and discernment that, you know, ultimately the story's main objective to glorify God, you know, behind the ultimate message would be something that the individual I choose has in front of them as well. Mm -hmm. And I was getting a lot of candidates that were just, you know, they were, they were highly critical of my play and, you know, and they wanted to do all of these things and no, you can't. You can't write something that's, um, you know, talking about um, the incorporation of miracles and faith. It doesn't it's not a it's not a commercial angle. And I'm like, look, you know. What what I need to know is, do you want to do this or not? You know, Um, um, and their egos were kind of, yeah, even though they were some of them. self-professed faith-based screenwriters or whatnot, their, their egos, I felt were kind of coming to the surface more as opposed oh. to, you know, so. Thinking too, Jerry, that that is kind of, oh, I don't, I don't know really how to articulate this, but that's kind of not right on board considering all the fantasy between gaming and film that's out there right now. Lord of the Rings. I mean, I mean, yeah, just, you know, I mean, it was written by Tolkien for God's sake, and it's really a metaphor to Christ and the return of the King. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, when I yeah. hear that, I'm thinking, yeah. wait a minute, well, because, time out. I don't. Yeah, and I and I guess I guess the hangups and Brian didn't have this, which is one of the reasons why I chose him. Um, was that I'm basing it on real events. You know, the, the mm-hmm. title is Camp, is Miracle at Camp Redemption. And the subtitle is Based on Real Events. Uh, um, the Ultimately, the story, not to give too much away, um, um, but the story thrusts us by our central figure, the MP sergeant in the movie, um, who experiences a miracle on the roads of Iraq while being ambushed. And oh, my and you know the military as I do, Rebecca, um, try and convey to a panel of military uh, psych reps that you're, just not cra- <laughs> <laughs> that you're not crazy and that you saw this thing, you know? Um, and, um, you know, good luck on that. Um, but that's one of the challenges in the film. And, um, you know, and uh, so, yeah, with Brian, he he saw the potential of it. He said, yeah, this is great. You know, I mean, let's let's run with it. And if you're willing, I'll be the guy. And he was. I love it. And you have more things that are going on, too. Yeah. You know, um, I also uh, uh, I used to produce a lot of poetry readings out here in, in L.A. and particularly ones that were vet centered. Um, I have been, you know, it's tough with poetry. You know, you're always hunting for a voice, your own voice, you know, it's it's a, it's a sort of lyric or tone, a a sort of tenor to your poetry that's separate from anybody else's, but you're not doing it with that in mind. But for that, you know, I've, I've certainly had a little bit of uh, a focus for my work as a, as a poet, a poet writer, uh, for um, majoritively uh, war theme poetry. Um, and I just kind of finished, uh, um, really, I would say something that if um, if I were looking to get it published or produce, I would do that. And then that, that's kind of come around again, uh, but nicely, you know, it's kind of like the thing I do on the side while I do other writing things. So, um, so. I think those who have such creative, abilities do multiple things we wear many hats because 
there's always this one extension that leads into this other part of us. And then that leads into something else. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I find it absolutely fascinating. So can someone hear you somewhere reciting one of your poems at you reading somewhere? Oh God, you know, um, I have thought about posting some stuff, you know, and I think I asked you to forgive me the last time we spoke offline. Um, I'm just not the Twitter, Instagram dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. Uh, I have loaded up some poetry on Facebook in the past. Um, yeah, you know, I got to I got to have something where I, I can post it, create a Web page for myself. I just don't have it yet. And a lot of the things I used to produce in L.A., uh, I'd like to say they kind of via Facebook or whatever social media they've they've kind of run out. Um, but I, I eventually plan on doing that. Um, and Facebook is really if there's any social media for me, it's it's the it's the one platform I have. I do have parlor um i i don't think parlor is personally i as much as i'd love for it to survive i don't think it's going to make it um i haven't been able to get that sort of off foot either it just there's i don't know i can't understand i can't understand how so many people have ten thousand followers and i have like 200 (laughs) and it's been it's been over 150 I'm sorry. It's been over a year and a half since I I joined and uh, I've got 150 followers. So, I mean, I'll tell you, there's some interesting dynamics when it comes to social media. But OK, so let me take this in a little bit different direction. But I want to tie it into both of these things with sure. uh, the work that you and Brian are doing, whether or not you want to bring that to stage. And if you are, hang on, because this is where, where this all kind of mm-hmm. ties in. Our creative mm-hmm. streaks go, like I said. So being a company member of the, you know, Pacific Resident Theater, can mm-hmm. you bring some of your work there? Oh, I absolutely can. And I have, uh, Rebecca, in the past. Actually, Camp, Re- Camp Redemption, now becoming a screen version of that called Miracle at Camp Redemption, was originally produced as a reading, a full reading with the company back in oh. 2014. Yeah, it was, the, it was the launch pin, if you will, of me for the first time really sitting in an audience and listening to my own words while seeing them performance read. Yeah. I've got chills. Uh, Wow. Yeah. It was, it was a great experience for me and a learning curve. Um, um, It's a beloved theater. I have not um, been there in a while. I'd say in about three years uh, because for better or for worse, it's it's a theater that much like many of the theaters out here, um, they really adhere, sadly, even to this stage and at this two year juncture into the pandemic. Uh-huh. They so uh, adhere to. Um, I just think so many of the falsities that. Uh, are the regulatory CDC mandates of, of, you know, um, public consumption of entertainment or whatever. Yes. So, you know, I'm not a vaccinated person. Okay. That would pretty much with that theater. And and I would say 90% of the theaters out here preclude Mm -hmm. the entrance. It would prohibit me. Um, even now, you know, when things really, have opened up, you know, and yeah. so there's a, there's a bit of a conundrum, I think, with a lot of artists who are not vaccinated, don't believe the hype. Um, um, I can argue, as I might have with you, I think, when we last spoke, um, how there's so many reasons that you can defend your purpose of not taking the shot, um, you know, um, as to why so many uh, personal religious exemptions you would have and should yes. have, yes. Um, you know, when you think about what, in fact, they're mixing this, this shot with. Um, mm. And yet, you know, we're talking offline about Hollywood and about, you know, um, you know, as you I'm sure know, the, the, the majoritively liberal entity that the entertainment industry is, you know, when you're a strong faith-based conservative, it's really hard, you know, to um, 
to try and make headway or, or collaborate, you know, um, understandably, very it's mm-hmm. very hard. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. No, I can completely understand that. And with that being said, I still feel that if that's a person's choice, I understand that, but respect the other side of the coin that the other person has a choice too. And there's got to be a happy medium. You can't alienate people that are extremely talented very remarkable people like yourself and you know keep this wall there when there's still not a lot of information that truly provides the education that's needed to make and I, I, think, I think you made so. a good point yeah you know the wall and that's a great way of describing it there's walls i think particularly for that side of belief Mm-hmm. that have been set up by their, whether it's political leaders, their entertainment leaders um, that are so fear-based, you know? I was just and, going there. Yeah, yeah, yes, I was just yeah. going to comment about that. Uh, and that any outside conflicting opinion, which is based on scientific fact, it goes right over them. They can't hear it. It goes, you know, in one ear out the other. And it's, it's truly fear-based living. Um, you know, I've been real grateful that my daughter has been going to a private Christian school during all these years of the pandemic because they never really shut down for but more than 45 days. Uh huh. And all of these public schools that were just completely shut down by the unions, um, parents that entered their kids into what I call the Zoom nightmare for their kids' education. Oh, understandable that. And, like, and, yeah, and the numbers that were reported now as to how destructive that was, how much of a failed effort that the Zoom uh, thing became. I'm just so grateful to God that, you know, we found a school before the pandemic started and during yes. that, that kept its doors open and kept my daughter going to a school in person you know, um, yeah, that, that is really so necessary. I know that oftentimes I really, I am such an adamant person about mm-hmm. not texting because I feel that mm-hmm. there's no personal connection with someone. We misinterpret things and the lines of communication yes. become so yes. misconstrued. Yes. So it's kind of when you're, when you're young, you need to be able to know how to interact with other people. What are the yes. social skills that are necessary? And by removing that mm-hmm. and creating everything virtual, our, we're texting now virtual, we're talking virtual, and there's it's just things that yeah. are, yeah. yeah, it just doesn't work. So I know that, you know, going back just to the vaccine part, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot, I just think that initially people were saying, we have to do something to protect everybody. And so there was a rise in everybody being supportive of this, but -hmm. there was so much left with unknown because there was no data scientifically. I mean, there just isn't there and it's going to take years. Normal, Mm -hmm. normal studies take a long period of time and I understand it, but that's Mm -hmm. why I feel like there has to be an understanding on both sides of the coin. So it's yes. just disheartening yeah. to hear that there's that limitation. There but you've is, got yeah. so much going, Jerry. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited. With Thank you, you. I, I would really love to hear you maybe do a Facebook Live or something so I could just yeah. hear the passion of one of your poems. I would really oh, enjoy I'd that. Love I'd love it. Yeah. I would I would enjoy that so tremendously. We'll, uh, and we'll set that up for the next one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That is oh gosh. Now I, this will be a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can uh, maybe I could be cooking some pasta in the background while I. <laughs> if, if you want to do a setup like that, I think that would actually be a lot of fun because it'll bring our Italian heritage to the we forefront. Are, we are. we can yeah, talk yeah. about some things that um, you know from a military standpoint that everybody's going to be able to identify with. This will be a lot of fun. I would love this. I would, I would love it. That would be fun. I would love it. I know your time is so valuable and there's so much I want to share with the audience, but I do want them to really take hold of the stuff that we had in our non-fluff conversation. This was quite a very deep conversation with so much for those watching and listening to really grab hold of, because when they go back and look at you on screen, Mm -hmm. you know, they look at um, you 
alongside Matt Damon, there's going to be a whole nother thought process going on. That's Jerry. And I know him. There's so much that oftentimes during interviews, we don't really get to know about somebody that makes them real and you're real. And this is going to be (laughs) very, very exciting for the audience today. But before I let you go, I just, I got to, I've got this burning question about you being a boxer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. New Jersey diamond gloves. Tell me about this. This is a big deal. Well, I was a kid. Um, and, uh, if you know the boxing world, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but, um, I, I grew up in the, uh, in the eighties. Um, and a family friend of ours that my father knew, this young gentleman's father, when they were growing up in, in orange, New Jersey, um, this, this lad would become a world champion. Um, and he started his career when I was a very impressionable 10 year old. And he started his professional career at the age of 18. The individual I'm speaking of is Bobby Chaz and most people. Yeah. Yeah. He's a world champion, ex world champion boxer. Wow. That's a name you don't hear very much now. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he's a, he, you know, he was, uh, he held three different title belts. Anyway, as I was a kid growing up, you know, he was a friend of the family and I would go and watch his fights and my father would take me and I met his, yeah, I met him and I went to his gym as a kid and I just started to compete um, on my own out of inspiration. And uh, I had about five fights in the diamond gloves. I was uh, four and one as a young 14, 15 year old. And then my mother, as you would expect with a, a good oh. Italian mother, uh, uh, my late beautiful mother had put a stop on it right away when I came home with a, (laughs) 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 she threw a, she threw a shoe at my father and said, that's it. It's over. He can play football. He will not box. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to my time in the army. Being, being a ex boxer, my base in Iraq had the commanders had created this way to, get stress out of everybody by having a, a boxing competition. And, um, and I helped train a lot of my soldiers to compete in those matches. That is and, neat. Yeah. And I was like the trainer for hire on my base and I'd spar with them and I teach them about, you know, maneuvers and cutting the ring off and how to throw a shotgun jab and yada, yada. And, um, and, um, you know, my, my history with the diamond gloves as a kid kind of was something that they found out and said, yeah, I'm going to compete in this. Can you help me learn how to fight? I don't, I don't know the first thing about an actual, you know, technique or anything. So I would do that. And, um, and I had a good handful of guys that were in my unit that, uh, you know, they did quite well, some of them, uh, most of them. So, um, yeah. well, this just brought even another yeah. whole component. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I love the palette of experience that you have and the things that you've done. And mm-hmm. I just really want to thank you so much for your oh, wow. coming up at, as in acting on behalf of patriotism and, and enlisting. I know it was a late age as we talked about, but thank yeah. you so much. I know there's more that we can talk about in time of service and uh and things Mm -hmm. within there but thank you oh thank you thank you yeah we will we will absolutely yes i and i and i just the the, lot of the things that we have coming i'm just like oh gosh i want to talk about this this, that, and the other thing but thank you so much for your time with us today i do appreciate it and i know the audience is going to be i mean they're going to go back and rewatch things now and this is what we want them to do they want to we want them to get to know you and then we'll be We're going to be talking about some other things. So thank you so much. Tell the audience too, what's the best thing for you that you would like them, their call to action to be connecting with you on Facebook or I mean, what would you like the audience to do? Uh, In pursuit of my endeavors or in their own? Uh, Yeah, no, I mean, you know, stay tuned, uh, <laughs> stay tuned via Facebook, uh, IMDB, um, 
again, I, I have thought about and I'm in the works of putting up a, uh, I guess, a web page for myself. Um, Beautiful. Oh, so yeah. And stay tuned to this show uh, yes. as I hope to return. Um, and <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, again, I'm an old timer, so um, I never jumped on the Twitter, Instagram bandwagon. Um, maybe that's best, but um, I am on Parlor, so uh, you can find me there. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. If you have not had a chance to see any of the films that we talked about today and you also want to see more, head on over to Jerry's IMDb. I'll have that in the links and you'll be able to find it through me. Even if you just you say, I can't find it. You email me, Rebecca Mahan at publicist.com. I'll tell you what, I'll get it out to you. You've got to see that mm-hmm. his his work, even if you just get to see the reel on it on YouTube, that you're going to, as soon as you watch that, you're going to be just like, okay, uh, which streaming service? Because I'm not leaving my house. I want to watch the rest of this, the beginning, the, the middle and end right now. Anyway, thanks for taking a moment to get um, to know Jerry a little bit better. There's so much about him. There's so many things that you're going to be able to acquire just through hearing the things that he's done and watching them. And I challenge you to send us a message and see what is the first thing that moved you. I ask that you share this with all your friends, family, everybody on social media, and everybody that you don't. Thanks for tuning in.